Well, good morning. How's it going? My name is Matt, if you don't know who I am. Uh, past the man, where, yeah, the man is in California. Uh, he's not here this morning. He is moving his daughter, Bethany, back up to the Tri-Cities with uh, her husband. So um, Steve's also going to be a grandpa, if you don't know that. Or you don't have social media, so way cool, all those things going on. Um, they told me that second service, the, the boys told me that I would relax more second service. Nope. <laughs> uh, I had planned originally to start out with some jokes, and you guys were all going to laugh and be very entertained. We were going to relax. This message is a little intense, and it was going to be a great time. But if it's all the same to you, I just want to get into this book. I just want to get in the Word, so... If you would, turn with me to Luke chapter 16, starting in verse 19. Why don't we all stand for the reading of the Holy Word of God. I'm going to read 12 verses here, Luke 16, 19. It says, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water And cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between you and us there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers that they may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let him hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Pray with me. Lord, you know all things. You know everyone that's here. You knew us before we were born. You know our eternal destiny. I just pray, God, that this morning you'd be in the room with us, that your word would go forth, you would speak the things you have to say, and that we would have ears to hear. It's a terrible thing to go to church, Lord, and not leave, having been in your presence. So I just pray that you would be here, and that you would speak. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can have a seat. I titled this message, Jesus Saves, but from what exactly? When someone takes uh, any kind of look at Christianity, there's these main themes that come up. In fact, if someone were to ask you right now, what is Christianity about? What's your faith about? What would your response be? What would you tell them? And I think the more popular answers, and rightly so, for good reason, are something to this effect. People say Christianity is a personal relationship with Jesus. Okay, well, what does that mean? Does that mean that he's my buddy? That I wear Jesus as my homeboy t-shirts? That he's my friend? Personal relationship, what does that mean? That he's my God? That Jesus is king? And why exactly? I have friends. I'm married, I have relationships. Why do I need a personal relationship with this Jesus? How about this one? Christianity is the gospel. It's the good news. Okay, good news about what? And if someone has their ducks in a row, they might be able to quote scripture. For instance, they might quote 1 Corinthians 15, which says that Jesus Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, He rose again according to the scriptures. 
Well, again, what does that mean? Why did Jesus have to die for my sins? What's the significance? And you can go on down the list and everything that points to the crux of Christianity, the incarnation, the crucifixion, the resurrection. It all has an underlying theme. And that theme is salvation. It's salvation. Salvation of mankind. I say underlying theme because the main theme is obviously Jesus, right? He said that you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but these are they which testify of me. It says that the volume of the book is written of me. So obviously Jesus is the main theme, but that everything that he came to do was to save us. Many people have lots to say about Christianity and about religion and especially Christ. They say things like he was a good moral teacher, that he came, us, came to show us how to love and how to live. And while in certain contexts those things are true, those are all true. The incarnation, though, was not God coming down to fix my marriage or to make me happy or to be my buddy. Now, does he do that when we come into a relationship with him? Absolutely. Mitch was talking this morning about coming to a marriage conference. He does all those things, but it's after the main point. And so the incarnation was a rescue mission, literally, to seek and save those that are lost. And I say lost from what? My point is this, the fundamental issue in Christianity, the reason that I need a Savior, the reason that you need a Savior, is because I need saved from hell. From hell. What's the point of the gospel? That Christ died for my sins to keep me from paying for them in hell. What's the incarnation? To save the world from hell. What's the crucifixion? God pouring out his wrath on Jesus Christ on the cross, paying my debt so that I could go to heaven and not hell. It's a central issue, no matter where you look. I'm sure you've heard this before, but did you know that hell was the topic that Christ taught on the most? If you take the words in red in your Bible and you remove the passages that speak about hell, you're removing the majority of the things that Jesus had to say. Does that bother anybody? Does that bother anybody else? I mean, if you're allotting content with importance, then Jesus Christ has hell at number one. Jesus, whether people like it or not, was a hellfire preacher. Again, I think the reason for this is because there's nothing more important in that he doesn't want you to go there. Now, I bring this up, or if you bring this up, in the world we live in today, you say the word hell, you say that people are going to hell, my friend, you better have an exit strategy because people do not like it. They freak out about this when this subject gets brought up. You ever had someone say, say this to you and you're witnessing to them, you, you, you mean to tell me that I'm going to hell? Uh, well, that's not exactly what I'm saying. You're not my judge. How dare you have a standard of righteousness even in the church nowadays, even in the church. There are churches that tell their staff, you say anything to offend somebody and we're going to have issues. Don't offend anybody. We, we only love them here. We don't offend them. We want a mega church. I heard about a pastor one time that called his guys together and said, don't talk about sin. Don't offend people. I want a mega church. And if you talk about this stuff, not all the time, but most of the time, you're not going to have what's called a mega church because people don't want to come and hear this stuff. They don't want to come and hear it. There's a church in the Tri that I heard of that told their congregants, don't bring your Bibles to church because we don't want to offend anybody that's walking through the door. What? Yeah. What? What are they preaching? So as you know, we live in a hypersensitive culture we're looking for offense around every corner. We are offended about everything. You have an opinion, you have an opinion about anything, you can offend somebody. It's gotten so bad, I think, that it's a spiritual matter. I think Satan has laid the groundwork for people that when they hear the truth, they're so offended they can't even rationalize anymore. It's just an automatic response from a culture that's driven by emotions and by feelings. 
We build our lives a lot of times not on facts anymore and not on truth, but on how we feel. I feel this, therefore I believe this, therefore it's true. You have your truth, I have my truth. Uh, I have so much to talk about this morning, we're not going to probably get to all of it. There's some points I want you to take away, I don't want you to miss, and this is one of them. If you're a person like the one I'm speaking about who's offended easily, you need to do a real gut check. And I say that because it can keep you from coming to the knowledge of the truth. It can keep you from the Lord. And how you deal with that is this. You need to be a lover of truth. A lover of truth. What that means is this. There was a series years ago in the late 90s called The Matrix. And the main character, Neo, is given a choice between two pills, a blue pill and a red pill. One pill, he wakes up, and everything he knows or believes is challenged or changed forever, his whole life. Everything he knows. But it's the truth. The other pill, he takes, goes right back to sleep, business as usual. But it's a lie. I think most people today, they want to pick that pill. Because the truth is too inconvenient. They don't want to deal with the implications of it. They just want to pretend and live in their own reality. Spiritually speaking, that's exactly the situation that the Bible says that you and I are, I are in. Before knowing Christ, the Bible says that we are like the walking dead, just wandering around, spiritually discerned. After coming to a knowledge of the truth, the Bible says that we are made alive to God, and now we see. And now we're his son, and now we're his daughter. But to get there, you must love truth. It has to be so important that you say, hey, listen, I don't care. I don't care what this book says. I don't care what the implications are. I don't care if I have to leave the things that I love. I just want to know what the truth is. I'm tired of living a lie. Just give it to me. Just give me the truth. Pure and simple. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> Quote Jack Nicholson. Uh, if you don't have that perspective, when you come to Jesus, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. This is why. This man, Jesus, in the Bible, is radical. He's a radical dude. When I first started reading the Bible, the words in red, I could... I couldn't believe the things that come out of Jesus' mouth. It was like nothing that I expected. It was like nothing that I had assumed. It's like nothing that anybody told me about. Uh, let's just go quit talking about it. Turn to Mark 9. Show you something. Give you an example of what I'm saying. Mark 9 is a parallel passage to Luke 17, which is the chapter after the one we're in this morning. My Bible has this titled, Jesus Warns of Offenses. He's going to be talking about stumbling people. The Bible talks about stumbling people, people who are, whether you know, they're little kids or they're young in the faith. A lot of times it's our liberties that stumble people. It can be our lifestyle. It can be anything, any sin. And when you think about what would you say to somebody who's in that situation where they're stumbling somebody, what would you say to them? Hey, you need to love people more. You should keep your lifestyle in check. You should think about this. Let me pray with you. What, what would you say to somebody in that situation? Check out what Jesus said in verse 42. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Whew. That's rough. That's a rough thing to say. It gets worse. He said, man, I'm struggling with going to the bar. Excuse me, the first one is stealing. That's what I'm going to use. Man, I'm struggling with stealing. I can't stop taking. I take stuff all the time. All right, man, well, you know, let's talk about it. This is what the Bible says. This is what you're supposed to be like as a Christian. You know, let's get a job. Maybe you can start doing the biblical principles and start giving instead of taking and, you know, God will minister to you and 
He'll change your life. What would you say? This is what Christ said. Brace yourself. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell in the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Wow. Wow. He goes on with more body parts. The last one, you know, if someone were to come up to me and say, man, I'm struggling, I'm into pornography, I can't stop. What do I do? Well, uh, you know what? Let's get you an accountability partner. And there's this app, and we'll, we'll put these electronic blocks in your way, and we'll do these things and this and that, and I'll pray for you, and, you know, God will change your life. Jesus says, no. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. For it's better for you to go into the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast in the hellfire. The worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. That, I don't know how you can get any more wild than that. You say, Matt, you're being facetious because he's not condoning, uh, you know, mutilating yourself. He's talking spiritual, spiritually, and that's all true. But imagine hearing that for the first time. The, the, the guy's reaction to this for the first time they just kind of shook their heads, and most of them walked off. They didn't know what to think. And so we've had a lot of Bible studies, and we can understand that this is the idea of removing sin from your life. But again, it's pointed, it's direct, it's a violence of action. Jesus doesn't mess around. If you have problems in your life, get rid of it. If you have a cell phone, and you're, and you're, a smartphone, and you're struggling with pornography, why do you have it? Oh, I have to have a phone. I have to have a phone. I have to have a computer. Okay. Jesus said, whatever it takes, cut it off. Now, uh, I think the point when you go through how he taught to people was that he would do anything or say anything to reach somebody. He could care less about offending them. He wants to reach them. It's pure, unabashed truth. Truth set free. It's one of my favorite things about the Lord. He's a straight shooter. He'll always tell you the truth, no matter what. You'll always know where you stand. You'll always know what's at stake. I think it's a certain note we do well take in nowadays. Sometimes I think people believe that they're more loving than Jesus because we avoid these things because they're uncomfortable. We don't want to talk about them. Now, on a side note, is it spoken in love? Always. Always. Is there a way to speak truth that might be offensive to some people without being overtly offensive? You bet. There is, yes. Are there judgmental Christians who condemn people? Unfortunately, yeah. It's always been like that. Uh, you, I mean, the, the one in social media now is the whole Kanye West thing. A lot of his detractors are what are so-called believers who should probably just quit talking. So yeah, those guys have always been around. But just because you have people saying stupid things doesn't negate the reality of the spiritual realm. You also have to keep in mind that sometimes, you know, people just aren't squared away. I remember when I first got saved, I was working on me in my mouth, things that came out of it. Cussing and taking the Lord's name in vain and that type of thing. And at the time, I was working at a Harley shop. Um... I was on the import side. I, I was in a dirt bike, so don't ask me to fix your Harley. I, I wasn't into the, the Harley side, but I worked there. And uh, in a place like that, you have a lot of guys who are, can be in a frust frustrating position. So I'm sure you've never heard your dad swear, but if you have, it's probably in the context of fixing something. <laughs> and so that was the situation. And again, God's convicting me. It's a burden in my life. And then I get saved, and now he's my king, and it's personal. And so there's a guy who all day long is getting frustrated on the bike, and he's, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, all day long. And I'm mm. And then finally I lost it. And I just turned in the middle of the shop, and I said, his name was Jesse. I said, Jesse, you're going to pay for that one day. And he turns around, and he goes, you know what, Matt? Maybe I will. A wrench is in his hand. Clank, 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 clank. Throws it across the shop and walks out the door. 
Effective? No. <laughs> There's a scripture that the Lord showed me later on. Speak with grace and season with salt so you know how to answer each man. Maybe we should do it that way. Okay. All right. Noted. But at the time, I was just a young believer. I didn't really know. I just love the Lord, you know? And so I always give a break to people that open their mouths because they're at least trying. They're at least making an attempt. They might not say it right. They might be, you know, weird, but at least they're trying. And God uses that. God used me in Jesse's life. I got to talk to him about the Lord. He was a Mormon guy, and I love Jesse. He was my friend. So spoken in love, yes. See, our problem is Isaiah 55, 8, and 9, where it says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. God does not think like us. We've got to come to grips with that. I say all this by way of introduction because this morning we're going to be talking about what Jesus said happens when we die. The reality of a place called hell or Hades. There's a lot that goes into this, actually, and we're going to have to dive into some theology. But I want to premise it with this. The biblical doctrine of hell magnifies the grace and the glory of God. What did he just say? Let me say it again. The biblical doctrine of hell magnifies the grace and the glory of God. He said, man, I'm a a believer. I'm going to heaven. What do we need to talk about hell for? Well, I'm glad you asked. When you understand exactly what Jesus saved you from, it does two things. First, it makes me incredibly thankful. And I just want to fall at the altar of God and worship him. And then secondly, it it motivates me to open my mouth. And I have a real compassion on those that don't know the Lord, on the lost. Um, I had problems with this when I got saved because I wasn't, I'm not a people person. I'm what's called introverted, so they say. And God's totally changed my heart, and I've gotten a whole lot better over the years. But when you understand the predicament of the lost, it changes your perspective forever on how you view them, how you speak to them, how you love them, and all that. Amen? Amen. All right, so let's get in the text. I want to start in verse 14 of Luke, just for context. It says in verse 14, Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Now, the Pharisees were a group of religious zealots, and they taught that if you were rich, then you were blessed by God. If you had good standing in life, then that was because you were spiritual and that God approved of you. Now, is that true? Is it true that if you have money, it's because God blessed you? Possibly. It's a maybe. There are certainly rich guys in the Bible that love the Lord. Abraham is one of them that we're going to be talking about. David was rich. David had a lot of wealth. And the Bible says that he was a man after God's own heart. But the difference between Abraham and David and the Pharisees is that Abraham and David had money, but money didn't have them. With the Pharisees, it did. They served mammon, says in an earlier verse, and they thought God approved of it. Now, you can be rich and go to heaven, absolutely. And you can be poor and go straight to hell, absolutely. The point that Jesus is going to make to them is that what they consider spiritual is an abomination in the sight of God, he says. So that's the setting we're in. It says the Pharisees derided him. And Jesus says, you justify yourselves to each other, but God knows your hearts. Your thoughts are not his thoughts. And then he tells them this story. Now, the story here is not a parable. Why do I say that? Because in parables, people don't have names. The reason people call this a parable is because Jesus reveals things about hell. And people don't like the implications of that. They don't like that. So they say that it's a parable. Well, parables are always earthly stories 
that represent a heavenly truth, right? Sower went out to sow is like. There was a master, there was a wicked servant who's like. Someone hid three measures of meal, or the kingdom of heaven is like someone who hid three measures of meal into leaven, leaven into the meal, so on and so on, is like, right? This here is the opposite. It's a heavenly story with earthly implications. And if this is a parable, it's the only one of around 40 that Jesus ever did this way. So it's unique. So they deride him. That means they ridicule him or mock him. And he says, God knows your hearts. And he says, let me tell you something. Uh, I'm going to, just for sake of time, I have scriptures here, quite a bit of them. So you can turn in with them if you want. If not, I'm just going to go through it. But in Jude, which is the book right before the book of Revelation, just a one-chapter book, in verse 20 it says this. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Then it says this. And on some have compassion, making a distinction. Some of your translations might say someone who's doubting, someone who's struggling, someone who's doubting. Have compassion on them, first group. There's a second group. Verse 23, it says, But others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. And what you have with the Lord is this. Most often, Jesus starts with nothing but grace, compassion and grace. But after a while, if somebody doesn't respond, he ups the ante. Again, he'll do anything it takes to reach somebody. So he's reaching out to these guys. They mock him. They ridicule him. Then he gives them a glimpse into their eternal destiny unless they turn. So in verse 19, there's a rich man. He's clothed in purple and fine linen. He's got the bling. He's living a magnificent life. Forbes top 100. MTV Cribs. I don't know if that's a thing anymore, but it was in my day. MTV Cribs. He's driving a Bentley. He's eating the finest restaurants money can buy. Living what some people might call the American dream. In verse 20, there's another guy. It says, And laying at his gate was a beggar named Lazarus, covered in sores, living off the crumbs that fell from Dives' table. You know what the crumbs refer to? Back when they didn't, or back then they didn't eat like us. I don't know if you've been to like... Um, like the medieval times, something like that, where they just bring bowls of food out. You just eat like you're in a circle with Robin Hood or something, you know, have utensils, and it's messy. Well, back then, they would take bread, <clears throat> excuse me, they would take bread, and they would wash their hands with it. And all the food and debris and grease that was on their hands would go on the bread, and then they would throw it on the floor. Those are the crumbs that Lazarus desires to be fed with. It's the debris-covered pieces of napkin from the rich guy's table. The only one that has compassion on this guy are the dogs that come and lick his source. Now think, for me, like a Pharisee. This guy has open sores, which makes him unclean, their eyes. He's getting medical attention from the dogs, an animal which is also unclean. And they think he's being judged by God because of his standing in life, because he's a nobody, he's a beggar. And then he dies. And when he dies, he's escorted, Jesus says, by the angels to what Jesus calls Abraham's bosom. The rich man also dies, and Jesus says he was buried. The reason Jesus probably points that out, because Lazarus dies, nobody cares. Nobody cares. There's no memorial service, no one remembers him, nobody honors him. He's honestly probably just thrown away with the crumbs. But when the rich man dies, he has a burial, right? So people probably came and said what a great guy he was. He had money. He was esteemed among men. Like all the things that we say at memorials or funerals, whether there's a reality to it or not. But then something happens. We get a glimpse in the spiritual realm of what happens when you die. 
So these guys are polar opposites. They have nothing in common whatsoever, save one. They both die. Death is a guarantee for each and every one of us, and it's what happens next that's the kicker. Jesus said, you're born once, you die twice. You're born twice, and you die once. Verse 23 being in torments in Hades, lifted up his eyes, and he saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. All right, I'm going to stop here and just explain some things and hopefully do my best not to confuse anybody. In the Bible, when you read about hell, it can be referring to a couple different places, okay? When our translations use the word hell, it depends on what Greek or Hebrew word is being used that determines the place that's being spoken of. And in the Bible... Uh, Depending on the word, it can be referring to one of actually four different places. So the Bible teaches that there's multiple hells. To make it even more special, some of them don't apply anymore, and some of them don't apply yet. Matt, you're the worst Bible teacher in the world. I'm sorry. All right, let me do this. In the Old Testament, the word for hell in your Bible is the Hebrew word sheol. Sheol. Some of your Bibles might still use that depending on the translation, but Sheol is the Hebrew word for the place of the dead. Now, depending on the context, Sheol can mean a place of the dead or it can mean the grave, like the place that you just put the body in, right? The grave. So Sheol can be translated grave or it can be translated hell, depending on context. In the New Testament, the Greek equivalent of the word Sheol is the word Hades. It's the temporary place of the disembodied souls of the dead. And when this rich guy wakes up, he's in torments, plural, in Hades. Then Jesus says he looks up, sees Abraham afar off, Lazarus standing with, there with him in his bosom. Then in verse 26 it says, besides all this, there's a great gulf fixed between the two, and no one can cross it. So this is what's going on. Before the cross, when someone died, when a believer died, or excuse me, when someone died, they went to Hades, which is in the middle of the earth, which I'll get to in a minute. The wicked on one side and the righteous on the other, which Jesus calls Abraham's bosom. It's a place of comfort. It's referred to in the Bible as paradise. Remember the thief on the cross? Jesus says to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. This is the place that he's talking about. And between Abraham's bosom and the place of torment in Hades is this great gulf or this pit that's fixed between the two that separates the two. You follow me? All right, now I'm going to insert this. There's a couple more terms in hell, or for hell, in the Bible. One is called Tartarus, and the other is called the Abuso, or the Abyss. And those two terms are probably most likely referring to the same thing. But in 2 Peter 2.4, it says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and then he goes on, that word for hell is the word Tartarus. I'm not going to get into it here. The context is that there's a special group of angels that sinned, a special group of demons, during the time of Noah. You can read about it in Genesis 6. Jude 6, among others. It says they're kept in chains of darkness until the bottomless pit is opened up in Revelation chapter 9. Then in Revelation 20, verse 1, it says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up, set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. A little while. That's the abyss, right? Where Satan is bound for a thousand years during the millennial reign of Christ. Now the classical view on this is that the pit, the abuso that's being spoken of there, is in that great gulf in Hades that separates the side of torment from the side of paradise. Still follow me? All right. It's all time to lose you. It gets worse. There are two more terms used in hell, of hell in the Bible. 
One is Gehenna, the other is called the Lake of Fire. And these terms refer to the final place of destruction. These terms refer to a permanent place where the beast and false prophet are cast into in Revelation 19 and where Satan is finally cast into in Revelation 20. Shortly after that, also in Revelation 20, it's where the soul and the body of the people who are still in Hades are also cast into a lake of fire for the names that are not found in the book of life, it says. Now let me separate Hades from Luke 16 to the Hades that we have now post-resurrection, okay? In Matthew 12, 39, it says, But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. No sign will be given in it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So remember when I said the Hades in the middle of the earth? That's where we get that from. Let me give you another one. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. By whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who were formerly disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah. So again, these are those fallen angels that were messing around in Genesis 6. Genesis 6, God, I said I wasn't going to talk about it, I'm not, but Genesis 6, God judges the world with a flood. He says he does that because man's heart was continually evil all the time. The side note to that is that there's this gene pool problem. Pick it up when it says Noah's um, generations were perfect. And what's going on was Satan was trying to thwart the bloodline of the Messiah, and these angels were doing weird things. So because of that, they have this special place in hell. Here's the last one, Ephesians 4, 8. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean but that first, uh, what does it mean that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. So before the Christ, when someone died, believers specifically, could not stand in the presence of God because there was still no sacrifice acceptable for our sin. So they went to a holding tank, otherwise known as Abraham's bosom. After the cross, our debt's paid. It's finished. And it says in the verse that I read that when Jesus died, he went down into Hades and he preached to the spirits in prison, which would have been... a awesome sermon. I have no idea what he said. Nobody knows. You're done. Paid in full. It's finished. Tell us die. It's over. And the Bible says he led captivity captive. What that means is that all believers who were in paradise in Abraham's bosom ascended with Christ into heaven to be with the Father because it was paid. Now when a believer dies, we go straight home with be with the Lord and Abraham's bosom is currently empty. We know this from Paul. 2 Corinthians 5, 8, he says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So now when we die, we go straight to be with the Lord. So um, I hope that made sense. I hope you followed me. Um, but I want to take a look at some of the insights now that Jesus gives us to the future destiny of those that don't know him into this place called hell. Because the torment side, it's still there. It's still there. Notice first, the rich man cries out in verse 24 and asks, If Lazarus can dip the tip of his finger in water to cool his tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Have you ever been really thirsty? Like really, really thirsty? Well, what would it do if someone came and dropped a drop of water on your tongue? Would that satisfy? I would think not. But according to this guy... He's in such dire thirst and heat that just a drop of water would bring relief to the torment that he's in. That's pretty wild. Think about that. That's pretty wild. Uh, did you know, according to Zechariah 9.11, that there's no water in hell? Can you imagine being so thirsty, so dehydrated that you're physically ready to drop dead, but you can't die? So this guy can feel. He's burning up. He's thirsty. 
He has eyes. He sees Abraham, Lazarus, standing afar off. He has a voice. He's speaking to them. He's totally aware. I say that because there is a rising doctrine called annihilationism. And because, again, people don't want to teach on the reality of what Jesus said about this topic, they say things like that when you die, you're just going to cease to exist. You're going to go into nothing. And that's pretty comforting compared to this place. But according to the Lord, according to this passage, this rich guy is totally aware. Verse 27 and 28, he says, please, I beg you, if you can't give me any relief, send them to my family. Tell them so that they don't come to this place. Notice that he remembers. He knows who his family is. He knows he'll never get to see him again. He'll never get to say goodbye. He'll never get to say he loves them, that he misses them, that he's thinking about them. He's alone, forever, separated, with no hope of getting out, ever. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Whatever the worst thing you can think of here on earth, Nazi death camps or being tortured for Christ or being burned alive, whatever the worst thing is that you can think of, you at least have hope at some point, even if it's death, that at some point this is going to stop. And hell, and I think this is probably the worst thing, is that there is no hope. There is no hope. You're in the blackness of darkness forever, the Bible says. He knows why he's there. Notice verse 30. He says, if someone goes from that, from, if someone goes from the dead and warns them, they will repent. He knows that it's repentance that keeps you out of this place. Matt, are you saying that I have to have a personal relationship and put my faith in Christ or I'm going to hell? Nah, I would never tell you that. But this book does. The Bible does specifically clearly, bluntly. That's what it says. This is a frightening, scary, awful predicament. Now, I was studying for this on Monday over in my office, and I'm currently on night shift, so nobody's here. It was like, you know, it was like 12.30 or 1 a.m. or something like that. I'm studying in my office, and I'm going through this, and I ask the Lord, I'm like, Lord, show me what this place is like. What is hell? What is hell? And so some of the verses I gave you, most of them I didn't, what the Bible has to say about this place. You know the passage, I didn't say this first service, but you know the passage in Mark 9 that we read where Jesus says the worm does not die? I found that in Isaiah 14, 11. You know what he's referring to? Maggots. Maggots that don't die. I, uh, it's like a couple months ago, I went to take my garbage out. It was at night. It was raining. I have garbage on the side of my house. I walk out the door, I lift up the lid, go throw the garbage away, and I'm like, why is this garbage can moving? And then over my side door, I have a motion light. And as I have my hand on the lid, the motion light comes on. And I see thousands of maggots trying to crawl out of the garbage can, I guess because they're drowning. And they're literally all on the floor, all the way to the door that I walked out of. <laughs> I don't know what my wife was throwing away, but I was freaking out. Can you imagine being covered in worms that don't die from your rot? Anyway, I get, I get done going through all these passages, and I walk out into the foyer, and at that night there was a fog that had come in, one of the deep fogs we've been having, and all you could see was those wicked-looking lanterns that we have out there. They look really pretty in the day, but when there's a fog there, and you're going through all this, and it looks like something out of a horror movie. And I'm not going to lie, I was pretty scared. I was just like, man, if someone were to run by there or pound on that door at that time, they probably would have died. I'm just saying they probably would have died. Either that or I would have peed my pants and ran out the back door screaming. I don't know. One or the other. 
But anyway, after going, spending hours going through this, I just felt despaired because this is frightening stuff. And I was like, Lord, can you just minister to me right now? Can you just minister to me right now? At the end of the day, the reason hell is so awful is because it's everything that he is not. God is love. There's no love in hell. God is light. That's why there's no light in hell. The Bible says God is joy, peace, kind, faithful, gentle. Everything you know is good is because of the presence of God. The Bible says that in him is life, that he is before all things, and in him all things consist out of Colossians. That means that the air you and I breathe, the comforts we have just to exist, is because of God. Everything we experience in life that has any value at all is a benefit from his presence, from his attributes, in his creation, whether you're a Christian or whether you're not. You get to enjoy this while you're here. Hell is not God being evil to people because hell is not God. Literally, God is good, so the reason hell is evil is because he's not there. It's a godless place. I was going to throw in some apologetics with this because I'm into that. I like answering questions, um, and questions come up with this topic. People, sometimes antagonistic, but sometimes legitimate, wonder why things like, why would God create hell? Why would a loving God send people to hell? And again, I'm into all that stuff. I, I meet with Steve weekly just to answer questions, um, give a reason for the hope that lies, in, lies within you with meekness and fear. The Bible says be ready to answer a man in season and out of, sand, out of season for the hope that lies within you. Again, I'm into all that stuff. But a lot of times, it really doesn't matter because it doesn't do anything anyway because it's what Abraham said. If they don't believe the Bible, then neither will they be persuaded the one rise from the dead. And again, imagine the pun there. The guy that's telling this story that they're not even going to believe if someone comes back from the dead is a man that rose from the dead in a little bit. So uh, instead, I'm, I'm just going to end it with this. I know I'm kind of running along, but I'm just going to end it with the gospel. Remember what I said in the beginning. A biblical understanding of the doctrine of hell magnifies the grace and glory of God. This is how. You and I were separated through sin, the Bible says, from the demands of a righteous, holy God, a perfect judge, whose nature forces him to punish sin because he's perfect. The Bible teaches that the wages of sin is death, and we fell. We sinned against God in the garden, and now we have a sin nature. And now we've become objects of wrath, separated from our Creator, eternally lost from the ability to be in His presence. That means we're destined for punishment in hell for all eternity because we are eternal beings. When you die, your body goes to the grave, but your spirit lives forever somewhere. And then Messiah came. Messiah came. And he took everything I deserve. He took all my sin, all my rebellion, the complete wrath of God that I deserve, paid the price in blood. He let his flesh be ripped open let himself be scourged, be beaten, unrecognizable as a man. The Old Testament says they ripped out his beard. He let stakes be driven through his wrists, through his feet. And he hung on a cross and he died for you and for me. So we could go home to be with him and not be in torments for eternity. First Thessalonians 5.9 it says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. That's pure gospel. Amazing. So now when I worship, all the songs, holy, 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 are you Lord, God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Bless my Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. I'll tell you, the last week, my worship has been awesome after going through this. It's Christmas time coming up, Luke 2.14, the glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Number one, I fall at his altar and I worship him. I'm just thankful for what God's done for me. Number two, and I can't in good conscience leave here without giving you an opportunity to say these things. 
to know that you know that you know that you know that when you die, that you're going to be with him and you're not going to wake up in a box in prison with bars, as it says in Job. It's the most important thing in here. It, if this is true, what else is there in life? Does it matter? Your money, your job, your family, if you have a boyfriend or if you have a girlfriend, if people like you. If this is true, what else is important than that? The wages that are at stake are far too great to bear. So this morning, if you've never got right with the Lord, or if, you, if you've just been messing around, or if whatever, whatever the case may, may be, God knows exactly where you're at. Whatever side you're on, today's the day. I used to have a problem with altar calls growing up. thought they were a pressure tactic. Like a, like a used car salesman type of thing. I said this, my buddy texted me after first service. Did you know that I was a used car salesman? So I, I didn't think about this during first service to an analogy, but I used to think his altar calls as a pressure tactic, like a guy who's trying to sell something. Come over, see this, good price, good price, check this out. Now I think, oh, wait, I'm not ready today. I'm not ready to buy this today. All right, but I'm telling you, price can go up tomorrow. I got a guy that just called. He's going to come get this. It's not going to be here. You better do it now. Do it now. Do it now. That's what I thought altar calls were like. Then something happened to me that forever changed my perspective on this. I was at church. Not this one, another church, but I was at church. I went over across the sanctuary to my dad. I shook his hand. I said, Dad, I got to go. I'll see you later. He said, all right, son. I'll see you later. And guess who I never saw again? They found a boat. Never found him. Still don't know what happened. The Bible said, today's the day of salvation. You don't know how much time you have. None of us are guaranteed anything. Not to mention the fact the Bible says the more times you hear this and you say no, the more times that Jesus unveils the eyes to the spiritual realm and you walk away going, not today, the Bible says your heart gets hard. It says your heart gets calloused. To the point in Hebrew where it says your heart can be so burned that you don't even have the ability anymore to come. So we're going to pray. And you be thinking about that. I don't say I don't know what there is to think about, but be thinking about it. I'll give you an opportunity if you want to stand for him where in his presence is fullness of joy, and in his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Last thing before we pray. The Bible says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you also. Jesus wants you. He died for you, but you can't be ashamed of him. You have to make a stand. He purchased you in blood to save you from an eternal separation. The least you can do is stand for him in a room full of fallen people. And I know how hard that is. But again, back to the words of Jesus. He went out to people in the open, and he said, I'm going to go to a cross. I'm going to take this cross. I'm going to be nailed. Pick up your cross. Carry your cross, and you follow me. Let's go die together. He said, if you're not worthy to pick that up, you don't follow me. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for your word that you tell us the truth, that you reveal to us everything that takes place and everything you've done. Thank you, Lord, that you paid the price, that you didn't leave us in this state of helplessness, but you came down so that we might live with you in paradise. Lord, if there's anyone here who doesn't know that, you never decided that. I pray, Lord, you just give them a boldness that you'd fill them with your Holy Spirit and they would just stand for you so that they would know they could come home. While the believers are praying, if that's you, I just want you to raise your hand right now and I'm going to pray with you and ask the Lord 
so that when you die, you know that you know that you know that you'll be forever with him. And you're not going to wake up like the rich man with ultimate despair. I'm not going to spend an hour here, but if that's you, if Jesus is speaking to you now and you know he is, just raise your hand high. I don't, I can't see everybody, so raise it high right here in the front. I see you guys. Lord bless you. Anybody else? Don't leave here without victory. He loves you. Anybody? I think if I see you, I, or if you're raising your hand, I can't see you. Or back to my right, I see you, brother. God bless you. Last moment. Another guy in the back, bless you. Okay. Other believers are praying still. You guys that just raise your hand, just look up at here. Look, look up, up to me for a minute. I want to pray a prayer with you. And it's not magic. All it is, is asking the Lord to do what he said he's going to do, that he'll save you. You just call upon the name of the Lord. So I'm going to say the words, you can just repeat them, but you have to make them your own. You have to mean them in your heart. Okay? And why don't, why don't you guys just stand with me right now? Just stand up. Don't even hesitate. Just stand up. Let's pray. Say this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, that I sinned against you, and I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please write my name in your book of life. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me the power to live for you. Lord, I thank you that you love me, that you died for me, and that you're coming back again for me. Please write my name in your book of life and make me a Christian. I give my whole life to you now. In Jesus' name, amen.